In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. What a joy it is to welcome all of you here today, especially as we celebrate Black History Month all month and the and today especially as we celebrate the many contributions of historically black colleges and universities. We're thrilled today to have Morgan State University Choir with us. They did an incredible job this morning. God bless you all. And we have the Sacred Music Festival Choir with us this morning as well, hiding behind the rude screen. God bless you all. And along with so many other educators from colleges and universities here today, we're especially honored to have Dr. Aminta Bro and Dr. Leonard Haynes as our readers for this morning. God bless you both and thank you. Thank you for your presence. You know, with all these educators in the room, it's funny to think about the fact that in Jesus' day, in Jesus' day, all the professional educators, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they didn't think Jesus was a very good teacher. They didn't think Jesus was a very good rabbi. In fact, they thought that he played fast and loose with the laws of Moses. From their point of view, Jesus wasn't rigorous enough. He wasn't serious enough. They didn't think he was strict enough in the ways he taught his disciples to behave. After all, he healed people on the Sabbath and taught his disciples to do the same when on the Sabbath one is to do no work. He even allowed his disciples to pick grain on the Sabbath to feed themselves when all work was prohibited on God's holy day. Jesus ate with tax collectors and notorious sinners. He conversed with women and allowed women to be his disciples. All these actions seemed to the intellectual elite, to the great educators of his day, as devaluing the rules and the traditions of the faith. They saw Jesus as a dangerous slacker who did not appreciate the importance of the laws of Moses. Yet last Sunday in our readings from Matthew, Jesus says that he hasn't come to diminish the law, rather he has come to fulfill it. For truly I tell you, he says, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law. And in our reading from Matthew that you just heard, Jesus makes it clear what he means by that. In our lesson for today, Jesus expands the law. He makes the law more than just about outward actions. He makes it about one's heart and one's soul. Not only does murder break God's law, Jesus says, but so does the hatred and the anger we hold in our hearts. Not only does adultery break God's law, Jesus says, but so does the lust we carry in our hearts, the desire we have to objectify another person and to see them as nothing more than a means to satisfy our desires. The Jesus, the religious educators of the day, thought was a slacker was actually just the opposite. He was telling all those who would listen that God has a higher standard than just the letter of the law. In God's eyes, it's not just what we do that matters. It's what's in our hearts as well. God has a higher standard, Jesus says, and if we're going to follow God, we who would be his disciples have to shoot for that higher standard as well. Now, I've served in ordained ministry for almost 30 years, and I cannot tell you how many times I have seen anger 
or hatred infect someone's heart and destroy a family or destroy a relationship. I've seen brothers who refuse to speak to one another for 40 years because of some argument they had, an argument that no one can now remember. They held on to their anger and their resentment for one another until it, in effect, they murdered their relationship. And the tragic thing was, not only did they murder their relationship, but they killed their family relationships as well. Because even though they all lived together in the same town, the children of these men were never allowed to play with one another, to know one another, to go to Thanksgiving or Christmas with one another. Tragically, these two brothers had to die in order to move beyond this anger and hatred. They literally had to be buried with them. In a similar way, I've seen numerous couples who've come to me for help in their marriages only to discover that each of them is holding on to so many grievances, so many hurts, so many slights, that there is this huge wall between them. And I can't tear it down. They are so angry with each other. They cannot forgive each other. And their anger is literally killing their marriage. God holds us to a higher standard, Jesus says. We cannot live with anger in our hearts. It poisons everything. I worry about that anger. I worry about that hatred. I worry about these things that seem to be infecting our country these days. We are so divided. And we find it increasingly easy to demonize those with whom we disagree. I'm afraid if we don't learn to heed Jesus' words to us this morning, if we don't learn to let go of our anger, if we aren't committed to finding better ways to understand and reconcile with one another, then we may end up doing irreparable damage to this country that we love so much. I've seen it happen all too often in churches. You know how it goes, some argument takes place there's a disagreement about something in the community, and people begin to take sides. Rather than working to reach common ground, each side believes the righteousness of their own position. They stop listening to the other side. People dig in their heels, resentment builds, and before long, what was an argument becomes a feud. What was a problem becomes a sacred cow and the community pulls apart. I saw it happen in a church community that I loved dearly over whether or not the altar ought to be up against the wall. What was in fact a relatively minor split destroyed that community in ways in which it has never healed. In a similar way, I worry that if we let anger and disdain and hatred for one another to continue to grow in this country of ours, that we will create deep rifts between us that are all but impossible to overcome except for, God forbid, some terrible national crisis that forces us all together. In 1 John 4.20, St. John says it so well, those who say I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Moreover, when it comes to some of our national leaders, there are those who say it doesn't really matter too much what a leader says. It really only matters what a leader does. A leader may say untruthful or bigoted or hurtful things. A leader may belittle others, 
degrade others, intimidate others with words, but we should overlook that, put up with that, because this leader is doing good things, as if the ends justify the means. But that's not what God says. God has a higher standard. God says that what's in our heart matters. God says that what we think and what we say matters as much as what we do. My brothers and sisters, because God holds us to a higher standard, it isn't enough to just pass laws against discrimination. It isn't enough just to pass laws against segregation. It isn't enough just to have voting rights or marriage equality. These are all good and necessary, but they aren't enough. God has a higher standard, and God won't be satisfied until our hearts are changed, not just our laws. God won't be satisfied until our hearts are changed, until we root out the bigotry and the anger and the hatred that is still so prevalent in our society. God won't be satisfied until we meet a brother or a sister of a different color or a different religion or a different ethnicity or identity or orientation, you name it, and the only thing we think is well, here's the beloved child of God. What an honor and a pleasure it is to meet you, to speak with you, to share this moment with you. Now, in a few minutes after we have prayed together, we're all going to stand and exchange the peace with one another. We're going to stand and exchange God's peace with one another. Now, some people think that this is just the point in the service when we get up and say hello and good morning to each other, kind of like a liturgical halftime in the service. But in actuality, passing the peace comes from this very lesson for today. Because you see, before we can come to this altar to offer our gifts, before we can come to this altar and receive the bread and the wine, the Holy Communion, the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are supposed to be at peace with one another. We are supposed to have let go of the anger or the grudge that we might be holding on to. We're supposed to be clear-hearted when we come forward to be nourished with Christ's holy food. And so when you stand and greet one another this morning with Christ's peace, ask yourself, ask yourself, in my life, what anger am I holding on to? What relationships do I need to reconcile? Who needs my forgiveness and whose forgiveness do I need to seek? Then ask our Lord to give you in the bread and the wine you receive this day, the strength and the courage and the grace to heal that which is broken, to forgive that which needs forgiving, and to love those you think are unlovable. Because God holds us to a higher standard, and we have to answer that call. Amen.